All right. I'd like if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke and chapter 10. And we're speaking this evening again, a part two, really, on revival and the universities when Christ comes to the campus. Uh, and so uh, this uh, may seem a strange verse in connection with this topic, but it really isn't. And so Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 2, where it says this, Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And you'll understand as we continue why I have used that particular scripture reference. But as we think about our young men and young women going off to university, what we tend to do is pray for their survival and not for revival, right? We're, we're hoping that they will make it through with their faith intact, because we know that universities are places where generally Christ is not owned, uh, places where often uh, young people's faith is constantly under attack. And so we tend to be praying just for their survival. But uh, as we learned last time, there have been times where universities have been scenes of remarkable revivals. And we talked a lot about Cambridge last time. It was talked about a lot of other things, but we talked about a particular revival at Cambridge under the ministry of the most unlikely person you would ever think of reaching the intellectuals of England, a Massachusetts shoe clerk called D.L. Moody. And what I want to do is go on from there from D.L. Moody's campaign and talk about the impact of some of the students who were saved. Now, some of them we already are familiar with in our little talks. We've talked about the Cambridge Seven. And I want to think about the Cambridge Seven. But before we go forward from that campaign, I want to go backwards and take a, as it were, a backward step. And what I want to do, and the reason I want to do that is because there really is a story behind the story of that Cambridge revival. And I didn't know that until I was doing more research in preparation for this weekend. Uh, but what I found was that there really is a story behind the story of that Cambridge revival. And it goes back to China of all places. And there was a missionary in China. His name was a Dr. Harold Schofield. And uh, he was a very accomplished medical doctor, brilliant in many ways, had all kinds of medical qualifications, and yet the Lord used uh, uh, Hudson Taylor, uh, another person who had laid prostrate, presented himself a living sacrifice, the Lord took him up and used him, it was Hudson Taylor. Well, he had used Hudson Taylor to challenge this man about the needs of inland China, and so uh, Harold Schofield had gone to labor in inland China with the China Inland Mission. And uh, as he went into this inland mission area of China, uh, he found uh, that it was, it was a, a very difficult, no, nothing glamorous about the work uh, in interior China. Uh, the stench of dung was everywhere, mingled with the stench of unwashed bodies. A disease was common, especially among the poor peasants. Uh, class were, were just riddled with disease. And in fact, Dr. Schofield himself would later die uh, from in, in 1883 from typhus that he would actually get from a tick, uh, not sorry, not a tick, a, a lice of one of his patients. And of course, the, the lice had sucked the blood of somebody who had typhus and then injected it into his system and he would die of typhus. Interestingly enough, I, and again, I didn't really know much about this man, but I did a little bit of research, and uh, a lot of the operations he performed uh, were in connection with wolf bites in northern China, uh, which I would never anticipate or even imagine, but he was constantly uh, sewing people up who had been attacked by wolves in northern China. Anyway, one of the things that was uh, burdened him greatly at that time was the fact that in the province that, that he was in, in northern China, there was 9 million people, and there were five missionaries. 
and the needs were overwhelming. And there was no uh, students uh, er leaving university and following him in his footsteps, even though uh, he had gone there, there was no, uh, he, and he, he began to pray. He was a man of great uh, prayer uh, principles and, and uh, would lay before God in prayer, praying specifically that the Lord would send laborers to inland China. And he was praying specifically for university men, men trained in mind and body uh, for leadership, because many of the, uh, the, the missionaries with the CIM were not uh, of that caliber. And that's what he began to pray for. Lord, send us these kind of men. And so <clears throat> as he prayed, and uh, <laughs> tragically, uh, at that time, uh, many young men that felt the call to the mission field, uh, they followed the, the heroes of the day, which were men like David Livingston uh, to Africa or William Carey to India. And very few had heard of, heard of CIM or even had heard of Hudson Taylor at that time. And so uh, China was the poor relation as far as missionary labors were concerned. And so as he saw these 9 million unsaved heathen Chinese uh, in the Shanxi province, his heart broke over them. And he would, uh, after a hard day's work of performing surgeries, learning Chinese, sharing the gospel, he would get on his knees, shut himself off from the world, and he would beseech God specifically, Lord, raise up Bible teachers, raise up shepherds, especially from the universities, and send them to China. And when Dr. Schofield died in 1883, he had not seen an answer to his prayer. But keep 1883 in your mind, because in 1884, we're going to concentrate on something remarkable that was going to happen, that was going to answer his prayer in a very specific way. So back to the Cambridge Seven and the after the Moody Crusade. The Moody Crusade, as we said, over 100 uh, undergraduates from Cambridge University were converted. And some of them became very well known, particularly these seven young men who became historically known as the Cambridge Seven. Of course, they were the cream of England's uh, intellectual elite, sporting elite. They were, they were uh, amazing young men. And so it captivated the imagination of the whole nation that these individuals would do this. And so these seven young men, after they had experienced uh, salvation, in a clear way through Moody's preaching. They had then gone to Keswick meetings that were actually held in London. They hadn't actually gone to Keswick yet, uh, but had consecrated themselves fully uh, to the Lord uh, and had certainly enjoyed that, that, uh, that higher life, in a sense, of, of living victoriously for the Lord Jesus. These men set off touring the universities of England and Scotland sharing their message. And everywhere they went, the result was multiples came to Christ. And there was really a revival that occurred as a result of the Cambridge Seven going across England, sharing their message. And although only one of them really was a very gifted speaker, uh, <clears throat> that was uh, a man called Stanley Smith, uh, but the rest of them, uh, they'd give their testimonies and just the sheer sincerity and reality of these young men leaving everything and being willing to go to China really captured the imagination of the people. And so they gave heart moving testimony uh, to the grace of God in their lives, to how they've been called to China. And so as a result of this, many, as we said, were converted in their meetings and they themselves went out witnessing to their friends and brought them to Christ. So it was a real massive ingathering of souls at this time. Such was the impact that actually the Queen of England, Victoria, was pleased to receive a booklet containing the testimonies of the Cambridge Seven. And she was said she treasured it as something that really meant something to her. And, and so, it, again, it even reached the throne of England, the impact of these seven young men. And, of course, uh, as well as seeing a lot of people come to Christ, 
it resulted in a really an, an awakening of a sleeping church, something that had really burdened Harold Schofield. He was praying the needs of the multitude and a sleeping church just caused his heart to ache. And he cried out to the Lord, Lord, send laborers, do a work, uh, awake the church. And so that's exactly what these young men did. And so... <clears throat> The result of it was that this, the influence of the Cambridge Seven, it even crossed the Atlantic and a similar movement began in the United States under a man called Robert Wilder called the Student Volunteer Movement. And so it was, this was a sweeping movement that impacted both uh, continents and uh, was an amazing thing. Now, I wanna go back to revival on university campuses because of course, many of these young men went to university campuses preaching the gospel. But I want to zone in on one particular campus, and that's the University of Edinburgh. <clears throat> and I want to think about the years of 1884. I remember we said that Mr. Schofield died in 1883. In 1884, revival would break out on the campus of the University of Edinburgh, and many of the young men who were converted would give themselves to go to the mission field. And so his prayer was answered after he died, but his prayer was answered in a marvelous way. So 1884 to 1894. So really a 10 year period of revival on the University of Edinburgh. Now, prior to the revival, one student uh, writing at the time said, the spiritual life at the university was at an all time low. He said that the only sign of any spiritual life was a poorly attended Saturday morning prayer meeting. But then he went abroad uh, and he was gone for a number of years and he came back. And in 1886, so revival occurred in 84. He was talking about conditions prior to 1884. He came back in 1886 and he found that the Odd Fellows Hall in Edinburgh was filled every Saturday night with 600 students avidly listening to the gospel, praying together. I mean, just amazing things. And so he, he said the whole spiritual atmosphere of Edinburgh University had changed between prior to 80, 1884 to him coming back in 1886. So what brought about the change? Well, there was a series of events. The first one was, in 1880, there was a gospel campaign in Edinburgh by uh, a major Whittle, <clears throat> and uh, his name, D.W. Whittle. Uh, I know who Bob knows who he is because he was, a, a, as well as an evangelist, he was a hymn writer, and he wrote some wonderful hymns. Let me name three of them, and I know you know all of them. The crowning day is coming, is coming by and by. Who doesn't know that hymn? And then there shall be showers of blessing. We've often referred to that. That's Mr. Whittle's song. And then a third one is this, I know whom I have believed. We know that one too, right? Great hymn writer, but also a very effective evangelist. evangelist. He had a campaign and actually he used to work. His song leader was a guy called P.P. Bliss. You might've heard of him too. He was also, so they were quite a musical team. And uh, they had gospel campaigns in Edinburgh, 1880. And again, many young people came to Christ and quite a number of them being students. And then in 1881, D.L. Moody, his second campaign in England, found him in Edinburgh. And again, many more were converted during Moody's meetings. So now there's, there's a bit of a movement. There are people getting saved. There's, there's new life injected. And as a result of that, some of the students who had been converted began a weekly prayer meeting. And they were mainly students from the arts rather than from the scientists, uh, science groups, uh, you know, the BA students, uh, especially medicine. A lot of uh, medical students had been converted at this time. And so they... Uh, would meet together for prayer, and they began to pray specifically for a genuine revival amongst the students and the professors on campus. And so they're beginning to pray. They're praying for a real move of the Holy Spirit on the campus. 
and and then in the providence of God, there were several changes of personnel at the university, including the principal, and the new appointees all turned out to be godly believers. And so suddenly you've got a whole new host of, of students that are saved and staff on the campus who are now godly individuals. The principal particularly was known for his personal godliness. And so in, in the providence of God, the whole atmosphere of the university is changing. Which brings us to 1884, when Smith and Stud came to visit the university. They were, in, they were invited by a committee of six medical students. Of these six medical students, five of them actually ended up going out to the mission field as medical missionaries. But they invited C.T. Studd and Stanley Smith, two of the Cambridge Seven, to come and lecture at the university and to, to have special meetings. Now, again, think about these men. S Smith, uh, Stanley Smith was the ex-captain of the Cambridge rowing team. And uh, again, very physically fit individual, very in, uh, intelligent young man. And, uh, and you know, just uh, uh, somebody that would be, uh, a lot of students are hero worshipers. And so he would fit in that mold very nicely. And then C.T. Stood was the world's greatest cricket player. Now, I don't know anything about Canadian sport or hockey, so I can't really give you, but let me give you ones from uh, the, the other world. So in football, you've got Tom Brady, but like Tom Brady leaving the NFL, which he just did, but not to retire as a ritzy millionaire, but to leave it all behind and go to inland China as a missionary. That would be the kind of impact that CT Stud had or Lionel Messi for those that know anything about the real football where you use your feet. And so, you know, just the idea of, of these, these men, uh, the, the peak in a sense of their physical prowess and, and their intellectual capacity and off they go, leave everything behind. It captivated many, many a, a young person. And so as they arrived at Edinburgh, these two men, entered into a time of deep prayer and they were praying for the upcoming meeting that night and as they prayed they they really had assurance from the lord that he had given a spiritual victory and that there would be a work done for him that night so that evening smith spoke eloquently of the savior's, savior's redeeming love for sinners and while the less animated uh, and yet incredibly sincere stud testified to the savior's transforming power not only in his life but his family his father had been converted his brothers had been converted a great work had been done in the stud family and it had transformed them and so he testified to these things and as a result of their ministry that night a deep work of the spirit of god was done that evening it tell it it, it says describing the scenes that both professors and students were weeping under the influence and power of the preaching that night. And the scenes afterwards were amazing. There was an after meeting and professors were leading students to the Lord. Students were leading other students to the Lord. It was an amazing, amazing thing. And so the crowds, they had to leave that night. After that meeting, they got the, the, the mail train back to London. And so an overnight train to London and the, the, the crowds thronged with them all the way to the railway station, wishing them on their way, uh, all the best and all the rest of it. So 1885, by special arrangement, these two men returned. But by 1885, there wasn't a hall big enough. They had to get a meeting place in the free assembly hall outside the university. And there were, there were at least 1,700 young men. And what was remarkable about this was it was... It was a movement amongst young men. Often we think of revivals and often a lot of women get saved. Well, of course, they need to be saved just like men do. But often men are, uh, seem to be harder to be one, you know, something about the pride and stubbornness of men. But this was a movement amongst men. And as we've said, students are essentially hero worshipers and they, they worship the athletic and the intellectual. And God used these young men to point them away from themselves, but to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then there was a professor at the university, Professor Greenfield. And it, the scene is described after the 1885 meeting. This man, his scientific attainments were second to none in the university. And yet in tearful, broken sentences, almost childlike in their simplicity, he urged students to come to Christ and they did. So uh, an amazing work that was done. And following up from that was a man called Professor Henry Drummond, who was connected with Edinburgh University and a strange individual. We probably wouldn't even allow him to preach in our pulpits because, well, for one thing, he was a theistic evolutionist. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, well, many of us would have no truck with theistic evolution at all. I hope we wouldn't anyway. And then secondly, not only was he a theistic evolutionist, uh, but, but he was weak on his view of the atonement. And he wrote a couple of books that are still well known today. One is The Greatest Thing in the World, which is about love. The greatest of these is love. And he also wrote a book called The Natural Law and the Spiritual World, which in their day were bestsellers. But Professor Drummond, a very close friend of D.L. Moody, and yet uh, he had evangelistic lectures every Sunday evening in Edinburgh, particularly geared to students. And what he did preach with great power was the, the amazing love of Christ. And as he preached this, uh, the average attendance every Sunday night, and this went on for 10 years, was 700 students. Can you imagine preaching the gospel to 700 students every Sunday night for 10 years? And many of these students surrendered their lives to the claims of the Lord Jesus. And many of them gave themselves to go to the mission field. Hardly a continent was unaffected by this move of the Holy Spirit on the universities of England and Scotland. And Mr. Schofield's beloved China got a lion's share of these young men in their missionary work. And so that man's prayers were surely answered. But just one little after note, this movement carried on really, the student evangelistic movement born at this time would affect later students right into the 1920s, including a young man whose life was made famous by a Hollywood movie called Chariots of Fire, a young man called Eric Little. And Eric Little would be deeply affected by this student volunteer movement and even participated in evangelistic rallies on behalf of the student movement before heading to China. So our time is gone, but by way of application, can I encourage us as we pray for revival, let's pray for laborers, that these that will be converted will have a zeal to take the gospel to the dark places of this world. And of course, sadly these days, there's hardly any places darker than the dark continent of Europe and the dark continent of North America these days, but th th they would have a burden for the gospel. Pray for Christian students, not only to survive, but to thrive in university as bold witnesses for Christ. Pray for Christian professors, and I know there are some, I mentioned some this morning. I'm not going to mention them by name because they're going to be on video and that might not help their cause. But there, praise God, there are some solid believers who are lecturing in universities. Pray for these men and women that they would have a bold testimony for the Lord in this politically correct environment, which is very challenging for them but that they would have a boldness. Pray for campus ministries and open air preachers on campus free speech areas and pray for the Lord to expose the false ideologies and tear down these strongholds that are destroying lives. So these things are designed maybe just to be an encouragement to us tonight that God can work and that Christ can have his lordship <laughs> 
even on the campuses of secular universities, because Cambridge and Edinburgh were definitely very secular universities. May God encourage us to keep on praying. Amen.